My name is Jillian White. I'm deputy editor here at The Atlantic. Um, joining me on stage is Fatima Goss-Graves, president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. And we are here to talk about not just Me Too, but also the idea of equality and vulnerability and what needs to happen to make women equal citizens, equal partners, and to make sure that they are protected, especially the most vulnerable women. And having this conversation this morning in this room is particularly interesting for me because I sat on this exact stage about two years ago, and the question we were asking was, will Me Too fizzle out? Will the ideas that were born of Me Too kind of just dissipate? Will we go back to where we were? Is this kind of a flash in the pan? And two years later, it seems like the answer is no. So we are here to investigate kind of what is the next step of this seeming cultural reckoning that the US and places around the world to varying degrees are having. Um, so I guess the first question that I have for you is what do you think the most significant and kind of life altering change to come out of the Me Too movement has been? So it's funny that you say you thought it, people were asking if it was going to fizzle because two weeks after Me Too went viral, I was getting calls from reporters asking if it was over and if it had <laughs> gone too far. And, and I thought, oh, we... Two weeks. We, yeah, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, we haven't even gotten started yeah. yet. And I actually think the reason is because people are finally grappling with stories and experiences that are so deeply personal. Mm. And I think the thing that has been most powerful and that I hope will be lasting and feels new is the idea that women across this country and really across the world who may have thought they had very little in common could be working and organizing around a shared experience. So you have women working in Hollywood, understanding that they have things in common with domestic workers and farm workers and restaurant workers, and actually having some shared experience, and then lending their power and privilege to those working in those sectors. That is new. We do not see that in this way, and they aren't they aren't thinking of themselves as, oh, those people. They are understanding the power of coming together across sector after sector after sector. That is totally new. Yeah. And to what extent, I want to focus on kind of that power that you talked about. I think in the beginning of this, there was a lot of fear and conversation around the idea that Me Too broke, largely because a group of fairly well-off fairly famous white women, and of course the actual phrase and campaign of Me Too started by a black woman, but kind of the break in this virality of the idea broke because you had Gwyneth Paltrow's and people like that saying, yes, I also was victimized, I also have gone through this. And I think there was a lot of fear that a lot of black and brown women, a lot of women from lower socioeconomic classes, a lot of women with less glamorous jobs who go on scene every single day would continue to go on scene. Do you yeah. think that that gap has narrowed and that the power of this conversation has been shared enough, adequately, more? <laughs> right, well, it's never enough, but you know, Tarana Burke's framework around Me Too is so powerful precisely because you can find yourself in it. And you know, I was one of those people who worried that the narratives would be stuck only in the entertainment industry. You know, and part of that is that, you know, I, we, I feel like we know these people, right? You grew up watching them, listening to music, seeing them on TV, and to hear they had an experience. That affects you. And I think when Time's Up was created, there was a choice to make. Mm -hmm. They could have said, you know what, we're going to focus on the very real harm and challenges that are affecting and plaguing the entertainment industry. And that would have been worthwhile. But instead, they understood the opportunity of linking arms and responded to this really extraordinary letter written by my friend Monica Ramirez uh, that was entitled Dear Sisters. And it was written by, on behalf of hundreds of thousands of farm worker women 
who reached out to women in Hollywood and said, uh, dear sisters, we know what you're dealing with. We have had very similar experiences. Yours are happening under the light. Ours often in the shadows, each really invisible. Yeah. Nobody's noticing it. And that provided a framework to allow what happened next with both Me Too and the formation of Time's Up to be across power, to on purpose ensure that we were finally seeing domestic workers and restaurant workers and having new conversations that were really conversations held only in the shadows. Yeah. And when I think about black and brown women in particular, um, it, you know, one of the narratives that me and others really deeply worried about was that they didn't see themselves in the movement. They didn't mm. see themselves. And so when Surviving R. Kelly came out and was so very much linked to Me Too, I saw the power of again and again through storytelling and through action lifting up the range of stories, demonstrating what we have in common, but actually basically saying we're done. You know, time's up, so to speak, yeah. with all of it um, across sectors, across experiences. Bringing up Surviving R. Kelly is especially interesting because I feel like part of the most resonant thing um, in Surviving R. Kelly and the backlash that followed and the charges that came was the fact that black women, particularly black women in Chicago, said, we haven't been quiet about this. Yeah. We have been screaming at the top of our lungs about this yeah. for years. Um, my husband is from Chicago and went to one of the middle schools where R. Kelly would roll up and talk to young girls. Yeah. So like this was not unknown. Right. I, I wonder to what extent you think people have gotten the message that part of the frustration of brown women, of women of color, of poor women, is that they feel like they have been screaming for so long and asking for help right. and telling people what is wrong and who the predators are. And it seems to take so much more. I mean, there's no question. I mean, it is not that people haven't been naming their experiences to everyone before Me Too went viral. Some people had and weren't heard yeah. and weren't, see, weren't seen, or we just decided that nothing important needed to happen, mm. right? And, and when I think about what was happening over the decades with R. Kelly, it was actually all in front of all of our faces, and there was sort of a collective sigh around it. Mm. Um, but women have been organizing around the country, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in other cities, in Detroit, around him particularly and yeah. not breaking through. Me Too goes viral, Time's Up enters the Mute R. Kelly campaign, and it transformed the ability to see what was happening in real time. And so what has me so hopeful about this period that we're in is that even long time conduct that apparently culturally people had determined was not important or was not gonna change or we had just given up, we're not there anymore. Right now, we're in a moment where it is clear that you either have to change, you either have to move in another direction, or something is going to happen. There will be consequences. And that is unsettling for people. Yeah. Do you think that knowledge has seeped through most industries. I think a lot about my experiences in banking um, and occasionally talk to friends who are still in it. And it, does, it doesn't quite mm -hmm. seem like it has pervaded there. Well, so this is why I think when people say, is Me Too done? I, I, we are still not done. Because we all can think about the sector in our head where the story really hasn't mm -hmm. yet been told. And I know at the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, we hear from people in over 60 sectors, right? So they are people who are earning really high incomes in some of the lowest paid fields. And there's some remarkably similar experiences uh, with people being inspired by Me Too, deciding they're gonna finally use the systems that their employer has in place, mm -hmm. going to use those systems, 
and then experiencing very swift and fast retaliation. And then they're still contacting us because they've decided that they're not gonna just left, leave it there. So I think we're gonna hear about finance. We haven't really heard much about the law. Yep. There, I've, you know, this is gonna come up again and again in so many different sectors. So if I were as leading one of those sectors, I would just take that as a given and plan for it yeah. and get ahead of it and decide to change before the New York Times story ever comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Or the Atlantic piece. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about kind of the breadth of the work that you do, because mm -hmm. Me Too and kind of response to that is one angle of it. But there's a lot of work around inequality, reproductive rights. What's kind of the yeah. bulk or the most intense work that you're doing right now on behalf of women? So, you know, at the National Women's Law Center, we use all the strategies we can think of. We think about law in really broad terms. Mm -hmm. We bring cases, we advocate for policies at the federal and state level, and, and we also engage in meaningful cultural conversations about these core issues. And when I think about what is driving our work right now, certainly the opportunity that Me Too has provided to have a conversation about harassment, but about core inequalities has been so important. It has allowed us to reconsider the fact that, you know, domestic workers are basically not covered under our federal laws at all, right? And a long time ago, a decision was made that that was okay. That if you were in a smaller workplace, or if you were a domestic worker, that the labor protections didn't apply equally to you and non-discrimination and harassment protections didn't apply. So we have been able to up in that. We've been able to have meaningful and rich conversations about why it is that restaurant workers are still paid a tip wage and what that means for them day in and day out in terms of the harassment and violence that they experience and the connection between low wages and work conditions. So we're having an entirely new conversation that's resulting in policy changes that are important, that are exciting. And so a good part of my work right now, even though I will tell you we're in a defensive climate, is proactive work. We're working with states and with Congress to introduce visionary bills that really up in long ago agreements about this country, and that feels good. But at the same time, <laughs> we're an organization that works on core issues, including reproductive rights and health, including access to abortion. And I will tell you, the threat that we are facing on this issue right now, especially in the South, especially for rural women, for brown and black women, for low-income women, it is unprecedented. And we have had to redirect our resources to address this threat. Do you think that people, by and large, understand the seriousness of that situation? I, I'm not sure yet. On the one hand, you know, the threats to reproductive rights more broadly have been happening for years, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that people were awakened to them. You know, Ohio would pass a law, Missouri would pass a law, and maybe you'd get a blip, but it was very difficult to get the public's attention to it. And what is different about this moment is that rather than uh, using euphemisms or saying, well, actually, we're going to um, curb abortion access for health and safety reasons, what we're seeing in these state legislatures is a deliberate and on purpose approach to get to the Supreme Court. So they're saying, oh, we are banning abortion, criminalizing women and doctors with the hope to get to the Supreme Court, right? right? That, that uh, clarity is rare, but actually fairly useful because now I don't have to be in a debate with someone about, are you really trying to end abortion? No, I'm just trying to shut down all the clinics in a state. But doesn't that, doesn't that, end it? you know, it, it, that was a harder conversation to have. It is much easier if you say, actually my goal here is to ban abortion. And so that is what we are facing. And the criminal piece of it, I, I'm not sure that people truly understand. Just yesterday, 
a woman in Alabama was indicted. She was shot in the stomach while five months pregnant. She was indicted, not the person who shot her, by the way. She was indicted for failing to protect her fetus. So these are manslaughter charges that are being brought against this woman. And I will tell you, the language that policymakers in Alabama are using about it are clearly uh, designed to paint women as effectively carriers, right? Not as full humans. Yeah. So uh, the threat that is before us and urgent and pressing cannot be underestimated. And you know, we, and I, when I say we, I mean the collective we, our country, uh, allowed abortion to be so shamed and stigmatized, even though one in three women have one, yeah. right? So you have this healthcare procedure that is so shamed and stigmatized, people don't even know how to defend it. So we are in one of those crisis movement moments. It actually feels really resonant to me from when Me Too went viral, when you know, there's this thing you've been working on that you can't figure out how to get people to care about, and now it's right before us. Yeah. It's time to act. And I want to talk about, I think, in conversations that I've had, it has been hard for people to wrap their minds around at once what seems to be this push forward of women kind of taking control of their power at work, um, legal power, legal rights, and pushing ahead on Me Too, kind of really calling people to account and seeing, finally, action on that. So women really coming into their power, in a sense. And then on the other hand, we have a situ situation like the one you just described, and you were describing kind of this moment for women's reproductive health as dire um, and as a really big and scary and vulnerable time for women. And I think people on occasion have a difficult time, sometimes I do, holding both of these things in their minds at once as the same exact thing happening in 2019. How do you explain that? That's right. Well, I actually don't think it's an accident that these two things are happening at the same time. Yeah. I actually think it's, it is deeply connected. You know, Michelle Alexander has that beautiful op-ed where she talked about which one is the backlash, right? Yeah. And, you know, we had been in this framework where we were talking about the backlash to our issues. And she said, oh, no, 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 we're making dramatic <laughs> progress. So you expect that any time you're making dramatic progress. The irony of the threats that we are facing right now on abortion is they do not match at all what people say they want, right? So you, you measure support for Roe versus Wade, 70% of people say they support act, a safe legal abortion, right? So, okay, well, if 70% of people want something, you would not expect legislatures to then go ahead and ban something. There's a disconnect. And that in there is a political crisis. And it's a crisis made both of stigmatizing abortion in particular, but also of what you have seen over the decades around voting rights and, the, and things like gerrymandering, right? And you have ended up with over 20 legislatures that are of one party and understand that they can pass these laws and, and really believe that there won't be political consequences, right? So it is not actually a democratic act uh, to pass these laws at all, right? 70% of people are supporting them. And so in Georgia, the vast majority of people are kind of like, what are you doing? We don't want this, and it still happened. And so the question in front is, are there political consequences when that happens? And the question in front of us for our courts, and it's really a question of democracy, is this is a question of the rule of law is whether or not decades of precedent that again and again and again have reaffirmed the right to safe and legal abortion, whether or not just having one change on the Supreme Court makes that all go away. And that's not been the nature of our democracy thus far. So that is what's gonna be tested. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit more about that idea of 
voters kind of not actually being on board with some of the policies that are passed, yeah. even though they might seemingly vote for somebody who supports that. A few nights ago, I've been here too long, so I can't remember how many <laughs> nights exactly, Chris Christie sat on this stage um, and essentially said that he thought it was a problem that voters felt that a candidate needed to 100% match their values and their ideals. And he called out, for instance, being pro-choice as one of those things, saying that just because somebody doesn't 100% match your values, such as being pro-choice versus pro-life, does not mean that you should not vote for them. So <laughs> I'm wondering how you would respond to kind of essentially what is a push from a former politician to have people do exactly what you just described. Right, well, we're seeing the consequences of that. Right, people believe that they're voting for someone. And we're also seeing the consequences, again, of the stigmatizing of abortion yeah. for so long, where somehow it has, and its narrative has been disconnective of what it means to actually truly be equal and to, to be in this country and live with dignity, right? And that has been a mistake, right? It has allowed people to sort of say, I support equality, and I also will allow this woman to be arrested and indicted for manslaughter when someone else shoots her, right? So you cannot have it both ways, and we have a narrative challenge here. We have allowed there to be a disconnect here. So I think people have to make a choice. We are deeply under threat on this issue. For a long time, people said, I support Roe versus Wade, and I don't actually really believe the talk that people would try to take it away. We would measure this, and you, know, you would ask people, do you believe that Roe versus Wade is under threat? And they'd say no. And I understand why they'd say no, right? Because every time the Supreme Court had the opportunity, whether it was 25 years ago or 30 years ago in the Casey decision where it said, no, 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 Roe versus Wade is still law of the land, or just three years ago where it was reaffirmed. So I really do believe there has been this notion that our courts will save us, mm -hmm. right? Listen, I would love that to be true as well, just as someone who believes deeply in democracy and the courts, I would love that for that to be true. But you cannot close your eyes to the threat in front of us, that these states were racing to pass the most extreme and cruel version of a ban. They didn't all look the same because they were sort of outdoing each other. You know, some states were like, okay, I'm just gonna ban abortion. And then others were like, well, I'm gonna add criminal penalties. How about that? Well, I'm gonna also criminalize the doctors and the patients. It's not enough to criminalize. And maybe you can't leave state lines right, to, to, co to try to access abortion care. So they were outdoing each other in, in the effort to be extreme. They're doing it because they believe they can, and they're doing it because they're looking at the Supreme Court, they're trusting that President Trump's promises will be fulfilled, that he would appoint judges that will overturn Roe versus Wade. And so that is what we're gonna be watching for. I want to let the audience know that we will be coming to you for questions in a few minutes. I have a few more questions of my own. But if you could start thinking about them now, whittling them down, making sure that they're questions and not comments, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, so you talked earlier, and we kind of got on the conversation specifically about reproductive rights because you were talking about kind of being in a defensive moment. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what else in your mind, in your work, falls into that bucket. So one of the things that we realized early in 2017 is that we were gonna have to put our litigator hats on more and more, and we have been doing that. And so at, at the National Women's Law Center, we've had to sue this administration over its equal pay rule. We've had to sue this administration over its contraception rule. We've had to sue this administration over its Title IX rule. And so that, that is defensive work. The difference is though, you know, sometimes you're in litigation and it, it can feel very alone and wonky. Here, what we have noticed is that people are with us. You know, they are wanting to be with us in this equal payroll because they're astonished that 
the administration just blocked the rule that would have finally provided a little bit more transparency in terms of how people were paying on race and by gender, right? So we, there is no question that that is a good part of our work right now. We also are trying to stop rules from happening in the first place, and that is really across every issue we work on in this, uh, in this moment. And so, you know, we do a lot of wonky uh, writing of notice and comment as a part of the notice and comment period. We have been able to get hundreds of thousands of people to write with us, yeah. to tell their personal stories about what it would actually mean to take away the current rules around Title IX and sexual violence, or to tell their story about what it actually means to make it harder for people to access public benefit programs. And that feels a little bit new. It, you know, I thought it was gonna be hard, to, and it is hard to just get people to call their member of Congress. Yeah. Now people are like, okay, I did that. What else can I do? Can I write a letter to HHS and tell them how I feel? Yes, yes you can. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering, we talked a lot about kind of the legal apparatus and I think going briefly back to the idea of Me Too, one of the frustrations I had in reporting out Me Too was how difficult it was to create change within companies and within the structure yeah. of companies. Um, and to some extent, I still feel frustrated about that. Yeah. And I think one of the things that Me Too brought up was the idea that even for women who have HR, who in theory have those rights, that HR isn't necessarily there to protect you as an individual yeah. in this circumstance. They're there to protect the company. Um, so I'm wondering what advice you have for companies who maybe have not you know, come to the forefront, have not been in the limelight yet, or industries. How should these institutions be thinking about restructuring to create better protection? Yeah, so I will tell you that more companies than I have seen in ever before are actually looking at this issue in a way that is serious. They are understanding that it is not enough to do nothing, which is um, an progress. It, it's, 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 it is progress. <laughs> Um, a, listen, HR does work for the company. And so individuals who assume otherwise are going to be disappointed. And one of the things that I think is hugely important for any organization that wants to really make change is, yes, you have to treat people well when they're actually going through the complaint process. Actually, if you treat people well as they're going through the complaint process, you are less likely to have a lawsuit, right? That has been documented, that people value, how, even if you don't find in their favor, how they are treated going through this process. But the most important thing that leaders can and should be doing right now is signaling to their organization their commitment for change. And it has to only come from the leader. So if you have a leader who's like, I kind of don't want to deal with this, you're going to have a problem because people aren't going to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. The message that you expect your organization to be different can only come from that leader. The other thing that I would invest in, if you have one area to invest in beyond a strong HR, is around your managers. Most managers are not equipped to deal with co what comes before them. So it is not just you know, telling them don't engage in harassment. What they need to learn is what do you do if someone comes to you and early on when you have an opportunity to change something before it gets worse, right? Most managers feel ill-equipped and unsupported and give bad advice and so they do things like say keep your head down, right? which might actually be good advice given the high rates of retaliation, but it is not something that actually moves an organization forward and it is certainly not something that matches the cultural moment that we're finding ourselves in. Yeah. So there are things for people to do. I tend to be impatient, I'm gonna be really <laughs> honest here, that I, I'm like, everybody needs to hurry up because you don't get these moments very often. Um, but I also understand that this is hard work. It yeah. is not easy. 
But there is a lot of things that organizations do every single day that are also hard work. So I, I don't let the fact that it is hard uh, let anyone off the hook. It's hard, and yes, you must do it. Yeah. I have one more question before we go to the audience. Um, who are the women that we are still not talking about? Who are the women who need to be brought into this conversation who are still the most vulnerable, who you don't think have had enough light shown on their circumstances? So there are so many. I'm thinking about women working as janitors or other people who are often classified as independent contractors. Mm -hmm. We aren't talking about them because they're harder to talk about. They're largely unprotected under the law. Right? We don't have a federal law yet <laughs> that says that independent contractors have this non-discrimination protection. But I think we're going to get there because it surprises people that everyone isn't protected. You know, why, why did we make that deal? Yeah. We can do that. So I want to hear more about that. I want to hear more about people who are in relationships that feel you know, in, in some sectors, they, they're freelance. In other sectors, they're gig. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, uh, we can make a decision that you are protected. The other thing that we have begun to talk about, but just not enough, is the many, many, the many, many sectors of women who you just don't hear about, the domestic workers, the farm workers, the retail workers, people who often have third party engagement. You know, my first job was at a record store. And I remember the harassment that I faced every time I went to work from my coworkers, but it was never as bad as the harassment I faced from my customers. Yeah. And then you're in a no-win situation. Right, You are this young person expected to, to stand up to uh, someone who's coming at you um, when you're also trying to sell them an object. It, 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 like, it is yeah, mind-boggling. So you know, retail workers and restaurant workers and other people who have third party facing. And what's ironic is as people go through, you hear the same thing from people who are adults working in sales, people who are working as lawyers and other places where their whole job is servicing customers, right? So these, the solutions are not necessarily simple, but they're not impossible. And we need to have more of those conversations too. Yeah. Let's go to the audience for any questions. I see one right there. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that there is at least one man who is still relatively un invulnerable to charges of sexual assault and harassment, and that <laughs> is the president. And I wonder what you think women are supposed to make of the fact that so many women now have alleged abuse and harassment against this man in this position of impossible power, and yet it seems like it is not cutting through or at least having any impact. Well, so I am one of the people, I don't think you have me to go viral necessarily if you don't have the Access Hollywood tape. Yeah. I mean, these, there were building blocks along the way where people saw accounts and saw nothing important happen and were frustrated. And so one of the legacies, I think, of Donald Trump is going to be starting organize, launching organized movements that name problems that aren't new. Harassment and violence didn't begin with Donald Trump, right? right? That, that is not a thing. But it is frustrating to see someone not held to account. You know, the most recent allegation and the level of detail for which it was given deserves serious attention. And we run a real risk if we sort of decide, well, he's not going to care, and well, no one's going to hold him accountable. There are other ways to continue to hold people accountable. Yeah. Every time you tell that story, that is a part of an accountability moment. What they would really like is for all of the stories to go away mm -hmm. and for it to be so hard for the individuals who are coming forward that they won't tell. So that is one way. The second is many of these people are playing a very long game. They're telling their story. They're telling their story again. They'll be telling their story after the election. 
I, I think that's going to be man. I, I think that's going to matter. But I, I don't disagree that part of what you are seeing with people finally being willing to confront the power that they're exposed to in their individual space is the deep disappointment in our political leadership's inability to confront that power. Yeah. Do you worry at all about people feeling deflated in a world where 2020, um, we're in a second term after all of these allegations, these most recent allegations, and kind of even as the conversation has been happening, at kind of the height of this conversation of this woman telling her story, the one response was something to the tune of, she's not my type, and moving on. So here's, you know, we work deeply on the, the Kavanaugh nomination. And during that moment, when Dr. Christine Blasey Ford came forward, there was this extraordinarily rich public conversation that was almost a teaching about the nature of sexual harassment and violence. It, it both taught this country about the myths, and in real time, you saw survivors responding, right? So you had Donald Trump out there uh, saying, oh, and why, she never really told anyone, and why didn't she report it if it actually happened? I don't know if I believe her. And immediately, a hashtag goes viral organically with people saying why I didn't report and telling stories. So uh, when I saw him resort to, again, pulling up old tropes around rape, that like, if you're not sexy, you don't get raped. That's sort of, that's not a new idea. That's a long time trope. I'm also seeing people respond to it. And so in some ways, his, unwilling, his willingness to dive into those really gross tropes provides an opportunity for our movement to come back and counter them in ways that are stronger and deeper. These are all ideas that, that lie on the surface. They're all ideas that make it harder to actually believe people. And they're all ideas that have meant that both in our legal system and in our policies, we have not done right by survivors over the decades. It did not begin and end with him, but it is an opportunity each time he disrespects survivors for us to have a cultural public teaching in this country. I think there was a question right here. Thank you. Um, both of my questions also relate to men. One is, um, I'm always startled and disappointed and saddened in a room like this when there are so few men. Um, and so part A of the question is, what is it that can be done in the movement? Because the way I see it, this affects men so greatly in so many ways, yet it gets less attention. Um, but the second part, which I'm going to try to say this in a politically correct way, and if I fail, I'm sorry, um, is I've always wondered why the Me Too movement um, didn't include more men as victims, um, as, as, you know, it's power. It is, I, I understand the other elements, but it's also power, and I'm curious if there's anything being expanded to include the power element and more men who are affected by it? Yeah, I think, so I will tell you, I, I know Tarana Burke at least would say Me Too definitely includes men, male victims. And there have been men that have, in this period, shared their story. Um, Terry Crews yeah. is one example, and there have been others who've talked about abuse and violence that they have experienced over their, their lifetime. And it's not enough, right? It, it, men are far more likely to be victims of sexual violence than they are to engage in sexual violence. But we have had a very narrow conversation around men. And it is also true that, again, when we think about our public imagination and our ability to grapple with more than one type of story. We haven't done enough to talk about 
the sexual violence ex experiences that LGBTQ individuals have had, that people with disabilities have had. Like, it's why I think we're just sort of scratching the surface on the stories that we need to tell. That said, you know, I actually looked around this room and I was like, oh, there's so many men here today. <laughs> and that is because I have been in room after room where there are very open rooms where we have been begging men to enter the conversation. And here's one thing I've heard. I've been hearing from men that they don't know how to enter. And I think that's not a good thing, right? I, I actually think and agree with you fully that we need men, both those who identify as survivors and those who do not. Those who look at the next generation and say, I want something different for my children. We need men who want to say, I reject that sort of locker room culture that then translates to toxic masculinity that then makes it OK for certain conduct to happen. We, we need people to be able to tell those stories and, and with and, and maybe this is controversial, but they need to be able to tell those stories without being perfect, right? Mm -hmm. I have been waiting, actually, for someone to really powerfully tell a story that says something like this. When I look back at 20 years ago, 10 years ago, to the conduct I witnessed, to actually the thing that I did, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. But here's what I commit to do going forward. We need stories like that, too. And telling that story is going to come with some risk. And so I understand why people aren't doing it. But I, I cannot wait. And I promise I will be there cheering for that person. Yeah. I think we had a few more hands up. Right back there. Then right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm also thinking about the missing and murdered Indian women and victims of the incel movement, involuntary celebrate, and how much bigger this whole thing is than harassment, and um, what's being done upstream about our culture of women as property. You know, I know a lot of men don't behave this way, and also a lot of women view themselves as property, but what are we doing about the cultural aspects of this phenomenon? You know, the, I, I, I don't disagree with you on the cultural piece. And, and there's lots of different ways to move and make and shape culture. It's why, it's why we leaped at the chance to partner with the entertainment industry when we, when we founded Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. But it is also the case that there are a lot of cultural makers, community cultural makers, people who are reaching different audiences. And so I see our job, again, around culture is continuing to make work with influencers and leaders to uh, disrupt these long-standing ideas that we uh, should just accept and tolerate practices. And also to make sure people are seen and heard and understood. Native women, I mean, that's another example. Mm -hmm. very, very rarely are those stories told. Or when we think about uh, the rise in um, in-your-face misogyny, that sort of out loud um, incel, but, but even bigger than that. Those were not new ideas, but they were so kept underground that people did, when they thought about hate crimes, they would never have thought and connected what happens with women as hate crimes. Yeah. And now we're making those connections that things like misogyny and white supremacy, that they don't exist in isolation, that they actually are dependent upon each other, and, and naming that is part of a cultural shaping too. I think we had one right back there. Hi, so right now we're focusing on regulations for what to do after cases of harassment occur. But as young children are going up, what do you think they should be exposed to so that in the future, our society just understands it's unacceptable? Good question. 
It, there's no question. I mean, the, the work on dealing with uh, harassment and violence with a legal tool is after the fact work. Although it is also work to change institutions. And I think that that is important because it is not as if schools or workplaces or housing complexes don't know that they have obligations. They know that they have these obligations. And so the question is, what is the incentive to do something different? There is a real opportunity, especially with young people, to have an entirely different conversation about what it means to have healthy relationships. What does consent actually look like? What, and, and even to plant those seeds really, really early. Like early as elementary school to have conversations about what does it mean to be a friend? How do you show up for a friend? How do you treat someone? How do you know if somebody wants what you're giving them? Yeah. You know? And I think I have those conversations with my kids a lot. Like, did that person really want to hug you? Let's think about that. Yeah. What, is there another way to do that? And it is OK to ask those questions early. And then as kids grow older, to have really serious conversations about healthy relationships. We cannot be afraid of that. And there are policy ways to invest to support schools in doing that. Yeah. You know, I've seen two things recently, one anecdotal, one an actual practice, where one was pre-kindergarten maybe, and there was a wheel where you could choose how to greet each other. Yeah. It was like you can high five, you can choose that you want to hug, you can choose all of these different things. And it gave just more of an idea that there is more than one way to interact with somebody and you actually do get to choose how people enter your space. Another thing I've noticed is a lot of my friends are having kids and I have a niece and a nephew, and I've noticed the thing that they have stopped doing is saying, go give so-and-so a hug. Yeah. And yeah. just telling people that it's a mandate, especially, they're little girls, that it is a mandate that someone gets to enter your space and touch you in a fairly intimate way because your parents have told you so or because they are an adult. And I think back to those interactions, and I'm like, that is incredible. That is progress. Yeah, I absolutely. I think that that is right. There, I mean, there are people in this world who love hugs, and there are people in this world who do not, and that's okay, yep. right? We, <laughs> we can sort of have a range of people. That is okay. The worry that I have, though, culturally, and 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 we'll be watching this in as I think in this 2020 cycle is this effort to paint Me Too as this sort of sterile, joyless thing. Mm. There's lots of joy in movement work. And, and when people do that, what they're really trying to do is say, I don't want to adjust my behavior for an individual person. Yeah. yeah. I know we have a bunch more questions, and I wish we could take them all. We will try and stick around for a little while after. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please join me in thanking Fatima. Thank you.